Hey there, have you ever wanted to go to a furry convention or you're at least curious about them but you don't know what to expect or even where to begin? Well, this video aims to help with that. This video could also be helpful to those who have been before but maybe you want to travel internationally and you're not sure what to expect. Maybe you want to know more about furry culture in general. I will be going over everything from general tips, from picking a convention to staying at a hotel and simple etiquette. But enough with the intro, let's begin. Why go to a furry convention in the first place? I started going to furry conventions about three years ago, but I have been going to meets and other events for nearly a decade, and I can tell you with confidence that furry conventions, which I will be referring to as cons from this point, are some of the most memorably positive experiences I have ever had in my entire life. The whole point in cons is community and fun. It's a place where you can indulge in all things furry in a supportive, safe environment. You can go there and not worry about being judged in this wonderful hobby, and I often think that's something that a lot of people underestimate for new time con goers. If you are a furry, I highly recommend doing this at least once in your life. Several times if you can. The atmosphere is often incredible. There is just this air of being yourself and the feeling of liberation that comes with that just cannot be quantified. You get to meet lots of like-minded people, make friends, party, dance, drink, sometimes too much, take part in events, see panels and see the surrounding area. It's basically like a furry holiday. Even if you're not a furry, these things are amazing. I have a friend in the US who is, who's not a furry and I met them in VR chat. He likes to go to fur cons because a lot of his friends from VR chat are in there and also he always has an amazing time hanging out and just partying and just seeing all the sights. I highly, highly recommend doing this. Picking a location. So let's say you have been sold on the idea of going to a con and you are now set on going to one. First off, you need to pick one out. If you live in the US, you have quite a lot of options. If you live in Europe, you have quite a few options as well. There are less in Japan and Korea, and I think there's one in Singapore. Uh, I think there's a few in Australia as well. But if you are stuck for choice, I would first and foremost ask friends that are local. However, if you don't want to do that and you want to look for something new, there is this. In the description, there's a link. On it, you will see a huge list of cons, how many attend and where they are located. Check the date of the cons. You will know if they are still active from that. Now, you need to consider a few things as well. Distance is a big one. If this is your first con, I highly recommend going to one that is local to you. However, I do understand that some people can't do that because, as mentioned, there might not be one nearby, either in your state or country. The further you travel, usually the more expensive travel will be. As a rule of thumb, don't break the bank on your first con, just in case something goes wrong. Also, a really good piece of advice, when you go to a con, go with friends. You will enjoy it a lot more. Considering some friend groups as well are spread all around the world, all agreeing on the same con and then meeting up there can be the best thing that you can do in that situation. Language is something you need to consider too. Knowing some of the local language if you choose to travel internationally can help a lot, and it's a good life skill to know multiple languages anyway, but sometimes it might not matter, especially if you're an English speaker. For example, in the EU, a lot of, a lot of locals will speak English anyway, in, especially in places like Sweden. The further east you go though, the less people typically speak English. Another thing to consider as well when picking cons is the size. The most popular cons are obviously going to have the most attendees. MFF, FWA and AC for example, which are all in the US, can have over 10,000 attendees and that can be really overwhelming to some people. It also means because the venue is so large, it will mean a lot of walking. Also being so large means a large cost too, typically. Euroferns, for example, is the biggest con in the EU, and the prices of those particular uh, well, hotels that they use can be quite expensive. Bigger cons, though, does not always mean better. I need to make that clear. 
Also, if you do choose to travel internationally, especially if you are traveling to the US, you need to buy temporary health insurance. Most of the developed world has universal health care, but the US doesn't. If you get sick or injured whilst there, you will have to pay US medical costs, and they are astronomically expensive. I am talking $10,000 for a fractured bone. Do not risk it, ever. Get cover. If you can't afford it, you can't afford to travel. Some countries will cover your healthcare even if you're a foreigner, but it varies between countries. You, you need to look this up yourself, though. Registering for a con. Okay, let's say at this point you have picked a con. Great. Next step, however, is registration. Registration is a process where you basically buy a spot at the convention or let them know that you are going to be there. It sounds simple, right? Uh, wrong. Most cons open registration on a specific date, and most cons will also advertise what date their registration will open. You need to find out when registration opens and save the date, because registration spots can go fast. Confuzzled 2023, for example, ran out of registration spots, and a lot of my friends couldn't go, you know, even though they were local to us. Secondly, when you register, you also get the option to not only attend, but to book a hotel room with the convention itself. The vast majority of hotels offer cons uh, a discount on their hotel rooms if you book through the convention itself, and that is because cons tend to completely book out hotels and any hotels nearby all in one go. That makes the hotels themselves a lot of money, and they tend to love furries because of that. Unless they are greedy, in which case they increase the price. You hotels know who you are. Shame on you for that. Cons tend to have two ways of selling hotel rooms to its attendees. First come, first serve, or a lottery, or a mix. If you are going to take anything away from this video, take note of this bit. This is why it's so important to save the date. You know those uh, like huge concerts like uh, Download Festival where the tickets just sell out in seconds on their website uh, you know, as soon as they appear? This is the same. If a con sells its hotel rooms on a first come first serve basis, you need to be at your computer ready for the moment they become available. Again, research and find out when that might be. There could be 10,000 people all doing the same thing, so be quick. If the con uses a lottery, there is less urgency, but the window to submit an entry to the lottery might be short-lived, so I would still advise doing it quickly. Once you have submitted your registration, you will have to wait for a confirmation email letting you know if you've got a room or not. If you are going with friends, I suggest you all try and get a room, because if you don't get a room, you can bunk with a friend in their room instead, assuming there is room and it sticks to the hotel's rules. When you register, most cons also have the option to apply for early bird or late leave, which means arriving a day early or a day late. Costs and how hotels work differently in different places. Now, let's say you have found a nearby hotel or you've won a hotel room or maybe you are staying with another person in a room spot. That's great. Here is some more information that you really should know. The hotels that are booked by the con will be in communication with the con staff, so if you break any rules, which I will go into later, the con staff will hear about it. When talking about hotels, you will hear the term uh, main a lot. A main hotel is the hotel where conventions are held. Hotels are a great place for conventions because there are a lot of amenities within the building or nearby. If you get a spot at the main hotel, lucky you. I have only ever had that twice, and that was at Confuzzled. Every other con I've been to, I was at a secondary hotel, or none at all. A secondary hotel is a hotel that the con has also completely booked out, where the attendees will overflow to. Usually these are near the main hotel, within walking distance. Most of the time it's no more than like a 15 minute walk or so, but some very big cons like MFF can be up to 30 minutes. It was a pain when I had to do that. When it comes to hotels, you need to know that not all hotels will accept debit cards when you go to pay for your room. A lot of them will want credit cards and you will pay for them when you check out of a hotel. If you book a room through a convention, however, sometimes, but not all the time, 
you will have to pay within seven days of winning a room through the cons lottery. Do not make the same mistake I did. Rewind to MFF 2022. I arrived at the hotel and went to check in. The room was in my name. The person at the register asked for my credit card and I handed over a debit card. She looked at it and asked if I had a credit card. I said no. She then said, because this is a debit card, not a credit card, I will have to pay the bill now, which was $1,700. Ouch. I had to move around a load of money so I could afford to stay there. Luckily for me though, my friends who were staying with me paid their share shortly afterwards to my bank account and it was all good. It's just a good job I had the amount required. I've also been informed that I was extremely lucky that the hotel even accepted a debit card in the first place. The last point I want to make here is also about hotels, but it includes things about bookings as well. Do not bail on people close to the con date unless it's an emergency. I have heard several horror stories of people doing this. For example, a friend once told me that he managed to win a suite that was meant for six people at a hotel. This was in the US and the total bill was $2,500. Close to the date of the con and after the refund period had expired, all five of his friends bailed for one reason or another. The issue is, if one person bails on a room like that, it pushes up the shared cost for everyone else and it can cause a chain reaction, causing others to realize there is no way that they can pay. In the end, my friend, he ended up being forced to cover the entire bill himself and it destroyed their relationship with their friends. Don't ever do that. If you have to bail out, you need a really good reason because you are going to burden everyone else with increased costs. I will go into more detail about what to expect when it comes to hotels later on, but for now we're just talking about booking. And with that, let's move on to the next topic. Flights. Book early. When you know you are going to a con, book flights quickly. When I went to NFC early this year, the flight from the UK was fully booked and basically full of nothing but furries. There was this funny moment where an old couple who were on the flight commented, There are so many young people here and they all look so colourful. I wonder if there is an event going on. And I just stood there thinking, you don't know the half of it. If you have friends travelling from the same airport, try and book at the same time and get seats next to each other. Obviously you might not know who's going or when, and if that's the case I would say book flights anyway and just pick seats later, as most airlines will let you do that. Just be sure to share flight numbers. If you're bringing a fursuit or lots of equipment, you need to make extra arrangements in the form of luggage. However, I will cover that in a few moments. There isn't a huge amount to say on this topic beyond that. Just be sure that if you are flying, have your passport and arrive at the airport at least three hours early before your flight is due, you know, in case there is a delay at security. If you're flying internationally as well, long haul flights tend to have much nicer planes as opposed to short haul. That, that's kind of required because a 12 hour flight can be really draining and boring. Mind you, when I went to the US, uh, it, it was me, Jace, Rio and Graham. We were given copious amounts of free alcohol to keep us all as wankered as humanly possible. That definitely helped pass the time. If you've never been on a flight before, make sure you go to the correct terminal to start with. It will be on your flight itinerary with your airlines. When you arrive, just follow the signs at the airport. You will need to check in with your airline, then go through security, then wait to board your flight. Keep an eye on the displays in the airport. They will tell you what gate your flight is at and when you are boarding. Luggage and what to bring. Again, there isn't a huge amount for me to really cover here. Just make sure you bring enough clothes and such and make sure the weight of your luggage doesn't go over the airline's limits or you might get fined. I will say though that if you are traveling internationally, make sure you have power adapters or converters for electronics. A really good trick, by the way, is to bring one power adapter or converter and then use a four gang extension cable or, you know, beyond. This means that you will have plenty of sockets to use. Most power adapters, such as the ones on laptops and phone chargers and things like that, will actually have a range on them that goes from like 110 volts to 230 volts. 
If yours has this, a simple adapter will work fine. However, if it does not, and you plug a device into a wall socket that's 230 volts with a device that's rated for 110, you're going to get a lot of smoke and probably a loud bang. If this is the case, use a step-down power converter, not an adapter. They are two different things. Now, this section is something that I can't really help on that much beyond this. A big part of being a furry is also fursuiting, if you own one. I personally do not own a fursuit. Could you imagine how massive a suit of this sonar would be? The thighs alone and the ear length, I would have trouble walking through doors. It would be hard to just get around. Also, on the same note as bringing a fursuit to a con, some con-goers are avid DJs or performers of some kind, and they will be bringing equipment. For this next bit, I'm going to hand over to two of my closest friends because I do not have much experience on this. I don't like speaking as a point of authority on stuff like this. So, first up is my friend Ignis, aka Pewter Bunny. He has a ton of experience when it comes to fursuiting. He's been suiting for nearly a decade. After Ignis, I'm going to pass over to Ganon. Ganon is a DJ who you may have seen if you go to furry music events in VRChat. He's also played at real life events as well a few times, and that meant traveling with a lot of equipment. So, Pewter, take it away. All right, I'm Ignis Bun in Telegram and Discord. I'm also Pewter Bunny while I'm in VR. Uh, one of the things I've always, um, or something I've realized traveling and everything, it's good that when you, if you're taking a first shoot with you overseas or anywhere that, anywhere that you're going with a plane, I think it's best to take your head, if you can, take your head with you, like on your carry-on or something. The head is the most expensive uh, part. You always want that with you. Um... I understand that some fursuit heads, especially nowadays, are actually uh, 3D printed and everything is made around the 3D printed base. So, with that being said, it's kind of like a, an iffy thing to take it on the plane with you. It, it might get damaged easy because people have to really, especially on a plane that's uh, heavily populated, it's uh, you gotta kind of squish in sometimes. You don't want to damage your head. Uh, but for people that have like foam heads or something like that, they could take a little bit more punishment. Uh, I think it's good if you can take the head with you on the plane. In my experience though, uh, sometimes your luggage just gets taken directly to it. Uh, I don't understand it because I thought I was traveling with the luggage, but I was with the airport one time. They said, you don't need to get your luggage because it's going to go directly to the uh, location. I'm like okay just as long as it's there it doesn't bother me um i've never had a problem with like i mean there's always you're always going to find scares like on youtube like videos and everything of people's equipment being damaged through the travels and i'm sure it's happened to people i have yet to have that happen to me i hope it doesn't happen i feel bad for people that, that has happened too it's terrible uh fursuits are not cheap even partials are not cheap nowadays Hi, I'm Gannon, DJ and club team leader at Placeholder Club. I'm mostly active online, but have taken various electronic equipment to cons before, including my DJ decks, and have heard stories and suggestions from my fellow DJs before. So our charming little dragon asked me to explain what it's like to travel with said equipment. The first thing that comes to mind when traveling with electronics is safety. A lot of devices tend to lean towards having an inbuilt lithium ion battery. My daytime job involves fire safety and dangerous goods. So I know exactly how dangerous these devices can be, especially under temperature change, shaking and hitting while traveling. It's, it's the reason why you are not allowed to put batteries in your checking bags for flights. You can only take it with you on your carry-ons. That means is everything with batteries like your phone laptop and so on for djs that could uh, also mean your dj deck if it's an all-in-one with an inbuilt battery when you board the plane one of the th things they ask you to do is notify the crew immediately if your device starts to smoke they have equipment to deal with it if you travel on land just throw your device out the window preferably to a uh, sandy or rocky spot or even parking lot 
That's also the best thing to do when you are at home. It might seem funny or excessive, but the fumes leaving your device could make using the transport or your home unsafe and unusable until sanitized. Never mind the fire hazard. Speaking of the fire, I'd also suggest you unplug any unnecessary electronic devices from the power if you are leaving for more than a few days. It not only saves you electricity, but potentially your roof. If you think it's fine, it's fine and it won't happen to me, guess what the people who, who don't have a roof anymore thought. Now that we have the pesky subject of safety out of the way, let's talk about the actual equipment I hold with me and how did I do it. The usual stuff I carry with me are a DSLR camera, DJ controller, a multitude of cables, headphones, power bank, adapters, laptops, phone, tablet, some uh, laser lights, portable speaker, and so on. You get the point. Vox mentioned taking uh, plug adapters and splitters with extension cables. That's highly recommended when traveling with multiple electronics uh, devices, especially DJ stuff. You don't know where you might uh, need to play or where you want to. The tr transport itself. Um, the easiest, obviously, is when you drive to uh, a semi-local con, alone or with friends. You can take as much equipment as, uh, as the, your cargo space allows it. Make sure you protect your uh, precious devices so they don't break. Pack them properly, put them in plastic bags against liquid damage. Uh, put clothes in between if you have to. Do anything to soften the blow. That applies to all sorts of transport. You can also ask to put your bag higher up so it's not uh, squished at the bottom. Keep in mind how your bag will be positioned and try to pack your electronics more towards the top. For DJs, I also recommend investing in a durable case specifically made for your controller. It not only gives you proper protection, ooh -woo, but it also doubles as a deck stand to make DJing that much easier on the back. <laughs> when you travel on land, you also have the option of taking the train or bus. I'd recommend the latter because you can book extra baggage and usually the bus goes directly to where you want to go. You don't have to carry your heavy stuff around with you and can focus on catching some Z's before the con. Taking the tra train could be uh, viable if you travel light enough. For instance, you could take a, a more portable deck and put it in between your clothes along with uh, other electronics. But personally, I'm still not a big fan of changing trains. As mentioned at the start, plane travel comes with some restrictions on electronics, but if you follow the weight limit and the do's and don'ts, you will be fine. Since every flight company is different in some ways, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I urge you to read their policies yourself. Selecting a different flight class can also change your uh, possibilities with some more baggage. I usually book a standard class with a check-in bag, so I can carry a fair amount. Uh, also notable to mention you will need to pack out every electronic device when they check you. You put them on trays and it will all be x-rays. Some devices like cameras might even get drug tested. But don't be afraid, uh, that's just a standard process. When you carry your equipment you sometimes need to travel in between transports. Uh, or you arrived at the city and you want to go to the hotel. For those cases I uh, usually use Uber. They're super convenient and uh, cheaper than taxi. As a last note, I recommend uh, if you are able to when carrying DJ equipment, take two from everything. It might seem excessive, but it's a luxury that uh, can potentially save your performance, especially if you go on main stage. But if you can't double your devices, at least double uh, the cables. I hope I managed to shed some light on this uh, subject and it uh, was helpful to you. Cheers! Arrival at the con and registration. Thank you for your input, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm going to drop Pewter and Ganon's socials in the description. When you get to your destination, you will need to do two things. Check in with your hotel and register at the con and get your lanyard. I personally prefer to check in with my hotel first and then go get my lanyard from registration in that order, but you can do it either way. If you choose to do it the other way around, you will need to carry your luggage with you or drop it off at a safe place at the con. Most cons have facilities to do that. For now though, let's just stick with my preferred order. Go to your hotel and check in at the main desk. 
The hotel will have your real name or dead name, as some people like to call it, so use that. The hotel staff are not furries. Don't tell them that your name is Vincent Sparkle Dog 24 because they will just get really confused. Get your room key or card, drop off your stuff, and then head to registration. If I am going to be honest here, this can take time. When I went to MFF, I was in line for almost two hours. It depends on the size of the con and how well organized the staff are. MFF is literally the biggest furry con in the world, so no wonder it took so much time. You need to register, because once the con's events begin, you will not be allowed in them without proving that you are part of the con, and you do that with an ID badge and lanyard that the con will provide. You need to keep this on you at all times, because if you walk into a non-public area of the hotel, there will be staff making sure that the people in there are attendees. If you are not wearing it, you will probably be asked to go retrieve it and then come back. This is for security reasons as well. If you arrive early at a con, say you've got early bird arrival, you can avoid these huge lines completely. Some cons also offer a VIP feature where if you are a con sponsor, you can register without waiting in line. When you register, you are usually given an event itinerary for the con itself, which will tell you when and where events are held. They will also contain the con's rules and hotel rules. Read them. I cannot stress this enough. Read the damn rules. They vary between each con. What to expect at a con when you are all checked in and registered. So, you made it. You are at a con. At pretty much every single con, there is an opening ceremony. This is optional and usually packed. Uh, some hotels will also film it and broadcast it to the TVs in the main hotel so you can watch it from your room. After that, you are free to do whatever you want. If you are at a con alone, a great way to meet people is to go to events. And there will be all kinds of events, like meetups for specific personas, such as dragons, canines, vulpines, etc. Meetups for neurodivergent people, music lovers, people who are into Pokemon, Final Fantasy, suit making, artists, etc. etc. There will be panels where a person or group who is well known in the fandom will also do a talk on their experiences and maybe do a Q&A session. Sometimes you get minor celebrities who are not part of the fandom but do voice acting for furry characters, for example. Sometimes they might be there. The list of possible things is quite long. You will also have my favourite part of the event, which is the con rave or dance, which starts in the evening and usually goes on to the early hours, and it's full of booze and fursuiters. There will also be a fursuit parade, sometimes focusing on specific species or a certain type of suit, such as inflatable suits or kimono style suits or something like that. There will be a dealer's den, where makers from all over the fandom will want to sell their wares. Tip on this bit by the way, when the dealer's den opens up, the lines are typically huge. The staff will put a limit on how many people can go into the dealer's den at once, you know, because of health and safety reasons. If there is an item that in there that you are set on getting, you will want to queue early before they all get snapped up. There will almost definitely be a lot of alcohol at the con, so drink responsibly and of course there will be room parties, but I will go into room parties later. Also, there will be events that <sighs> that might cater to uh, more adult you know, things in the fandom, like a, a not safe for work section of the dealer's den, for example, and there'll be events that are not safe for work. Almost every con out there has an 18 plus requirement because of this. There will be meetups at events that cater to certain kinks and fetishes as well, but you might not realize that at a glance from the itinerary, so you need to just you know, read it carefully. Cons can be chaotic and loud, but they are very fun. Hotel etiquette and room parties. I will now go through some tips and rules for hotels. First up, parties. Pretty much every con since their inception has had room parties. This is exactly how it sounds. A party inside a hotel room. At main hotels, these will be everywhere. They will be full of alcohol and be chaotic and lots of fun. You might even get room parties which are more private and adult, you know, each to their own. Just be sure to check con rules when it comes to con parties. Some cons have strange rules that make them stand out. 
Some cons, for example, do not allow room parties past a specific time, or they will remove people that are non-residents of the hotel past a specific time of day. A lot of the time, it's the hotel that are imposing these rules, by the way, not the convention itself. But aside from that, it's quite standard stuff. For example, if your party is really noisy and goes on for a long time, you might get a noise complaint from people who are trying to sleep nearby. If this happens, most cons will tolerate one warning, but if you keep being noisy, there's a really good chance that con security will just turn up and shut down the party and make everyone leave. Uh, hotels generally don't care if you bring your own booze or food to a room. Just don't consume it outside your room around the hotel. They're, they're not going to like that. Uh, try your best not to damage anything in hotel rooms either, because this will affect the reputation of the hotel if you do that. There, oh, there, there have been some shameful times in the past where a convention was so destructive that it was blacklisted from ever happening again. Look on YouTube for Rain Furist by the Internet Historian. My god, some of the damage on there was beggar's belief, and it really does drag furries names through the mud. The hotels also usually have certain amenities which anyone can use, such as a pool, several restaurants, maybe a spa. You know, ch check if you need a book to you know, use these things. Also, breakfast is usually free in most hotels, but if you've been up all night partying, you can quite easily miss it. It goes without saying that room parties require invites from a person that's either in the know or someone that's going to be attending. You cannot just knock on random doors where a party is happening and just expect to be let in. Although gate crashes are a thing at cons and sometimes they do happen. Overall tips and how to stay safe at a con. So now I will go over some tips that apply to the entire con. These really don't have a section to fit into, so I'm just gonna put them here and they're in no particular order. First up, staff usually wear different color lanyards to everyone else check which each one means in the cons book, the uh, itinerary book that you received when you went to registration. Money. Bring money. Specifically get money which is the local legal tender and get it before you travel because exchange rates on credit cards and debit cards can be obscene. If you are from the UK by the way, you can get a post office travel card which allows you to put money on it from your bank with an app and it's accepted in pretty much all countries. Um, other countries will probably have something similar. You need to look it up. Also, Mon Monzo is a, a thing. Bring a backpack, a water bottle and a battery bank. You will no doubt be walking around a lot and you will have things to carry and you, you need hydration. Most cons have water fountains set up in the rave or dance rooms. It's also a legal requirement for any restaurant or any venue that serves alcohol to provide free drinking water to its customers in the EU. So take advantage of that. A battery bank is an absolute godsend. If you are away from your hotel all day and in an unfamiliar place, waiting in line a lot, taking pictures, using your phone, recording, your phone is going to go flat, so bring one. Bring comfortable shoes. You will be doing miles and miles of walking. This might mean if you are a bit more um, friend-shaped than, than normal, you should bring comfortable and anti-chafing clothing as well. The elevators, or lifts as we call them in the UK, in most big cons break down all the fucking time. There is usually a huge line of people waiting for them. It's often a very real but funny joke that it's often faster to walk to a nearby secondary hotel than it is to take the lift back to your main hotel room. It's often faster as well to take the stairs, depending on how big the hotel is. Again, if you are friend-shaped, you are going to have to deal with that. Most hotels have staff-only lifts as well. Don't use them. You will get into trouble and get the con into trouble too if you do that. Do not hug a fursuiter or anyone else you don't know without their consent. This is pretty common. Yes, most furries are very friendly and huggy, but ask anyway. You might see some people walk around with a badge that indicates how comfortable they are with physical contact. Keep an eye on that as well. Or, oh, also, on this, if you have permission to touch or hug a suitor, do not feel or grope parts of their suit without asking. 
This is because some suits, which might look like they have extra padding in some areas, might not be padded at all. I have had a few people who experienced this, like a particularly endowed friend of mine had a stranger come up to her and grab her breasts whilst asking, is this padding? Only to immediately realise to their shock and the suitor's horror that no, that was not padding at all. Don't do that. If you first suit as well, be responsible, drink plenty of water and cool off once in a while. Also, at cons, there is usually a headless lounge or fursuit lounge where people can freely change into or out of suits to cool off. This is not a place for socialising. It's only meant for suitors. It might be okay for handlers to also enter. A, a, a handler is a person who assists a suitor getting in and out of a suit and sometimes guides them around because their suits might have like limited visibility. If you go into one of those areas, do not take pictures of anything or anyone. There will be people of all genders in there stripping down to their underwear. Be mature about it, let them go about their business. If you stare, you're going to make people uncomfortable, and if you take pictures, you will get banned from the con. This is actually a pretty common problem actually, and it kind of makes me angry thinking about it. Just be adults, be mature. You've all seen nearly naked people before. Don't be a pervert. Don't eat and drink around fursuiters. If you spill a drink or some food on a person's fursuit, especially something that is full of colorant and sugar, you might permanently damage their suit. So don't do that. Do not accept drinks from strangers. This is serious. Just don't. Even if you've just met them and they seem really nice and you've been at the con for a few days, just getting given a roofie or a date rape drug happens everywhere, including at cons. It's rare, but it does happen. I had a friend who was given one at a con recently because someone slipped something into his drink. Uh, luckily for him though, he knew the signs and when he started to feel off and his mouth went dry, he left quickly and contacted his friends who then took him back to his room. He was fine in the end. It's scary, I know, but there are bad people out there. If you drink alcohol, do so responsibly. Drink water or a soft drink between each hard drink and make sure you eat before you start drinking. This can actually be a serious problem at some cons. On this subject, if a person drinks far too much and passes out and becomes unresponsive, get help. This isn't a, haha, they drank too much, look at this silly person for drinking too much. No, no, no. If they are unresponsive, this is a real, oh shit, they are comatose and possibly poisoned. If a person vomits whilst they are comatose, there is a chance that they will aspirate and choke. So take it seriously. Get help from con staff if you think this is happening. Check the convention's handbook you were given at registration for contact information. At some cons, there will be drugs. Obviously, narcotics and psychedelics are illegal. If you get caught, you will be banned and possibly arrested, which will ruin your entire con experience. If you do partake in something like this, do so responsibly, surrounded by people you know. Don't accept drugs from strangers. If you decide to take part in adult parties or something like that, practice safe sex and be responsible. This is a huge topic on its own, but I'm not going to go into that here. Just, yeah, practice safe sex. Stay within your means. If you apply for a room, book a flight, go to a con, etc, etc, but you don't have the money to pay for it, you shouldn't have gone to start with. I've seen it a few times where one friend goes to a con and then days before the con or, or whilst there, they tell everyone that they need to borrow money because they can't afford it. This is a very quick way to piss off your friends. If you have no stable income, do not ask people to cover you and then find yourself unable to pay them back. Don't be financially reckless and then expect others to cover for you. If you travel internationally, it's a really good idea to look online and research the local etiquette and laws each country has. For example, in the US it's considered mandatory to tip for every meal at a restaurant, but that's purely a US thing. Pretty much everywhere else is optional. In Japan, they will just outright refuse to accept tips. 
uh, talking on a phone whilst on public transport is considered very rude in Japan, but like here in the UK, no one cares. It's perfectly legal to drink alcohol in the street in the UK, but in the US that could get you into trouble. Those are just examples. And, and try not to get caught in tourist traps if you travel to a touristy city. Each location will have their own and you will have to, you know, look it up. Also, bring any medications you might need or have been prescribed. Bring a copy of the prescription too if that's the case. It's worth checking online to see if they are okay to be brought over borders. For example, you cannot get simple drugs like melatonin in the UK over the counter, but you can in the US. If you bring a load of these here to the UK, you might get stopped at the airport. So there we have it. I hope this guide has served you all well. Again, I am only drawing on my own experience and of those who I know. But I think this has covered quite a lot. I'd like to thank Ganon and Pewter for your input. I really appreciate it. In the description, I will be linking their socials. And thank you all for your support. Uh, Ganon, Pewter, do you have anything else you want to add as a final note? Just be safe on your travel. Um, constantly... Constantly text people, call people, let them know where you're at, what all's going on. Yeah. Just be good. safe. Hmm. And love your brothers. Love your brothers. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, and thank you.